What a fitting song to start the message with. You are amazing. You are more than enough. Sometimes we just head out living life and just looking for enough. Just enough. But we have a God who is more, more than enough. Today, we're going to be talking and looking into the scriptures and contemplating that question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard? When this question comes up, each of us would contemplate that question, sometimes looking at our background, sometimes looking at our circumstances, sometimes looking at our experience. But I'm here to tell you, all that don't matter. All that don't matter because there is nothing too hard for God. And we are going to be looking at a Bible character that is completely opposite what God wants, what God desires. We're going to be looking at Abraham. We hear of Abraham very often in the Bible. He is always referred to as the man of faith. A man of faith. See him in the New Testament. See him in the Old Testament. Always reference to him. And he is the father of the nation of Israel. So always they say, oh, our fathers, Abraham, our father, Abraham. Who was Abraham? An idol worshiper. That's where he started from. Idol worship. And if we want to know anything about God and his hatred towards idol worship, you will understand why we are in a good place. In Exodus 20, he says, I am the Lord thy God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image or any likeness of anything in the heaven above, on the earth beneath, under the sea. You shall not worship them or bow down to them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation. This is the God who hates that, and he chooses an idol worshiper and turns his life around to become a symbol of faith and hope and confidence in Jesus Christ. If you are an unbeliever today, this is for you. If you are a believer, this is for you. Today, we are all in a good place. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We ask that you will inspire us through your word, realizing that life's challenges can overwhelm us. And we'll begin to think that you are not enough. We, we need to go around and find solutions to our problems outside your realms. Lord, inspire us through this word that you are more than enough. You are awesome. You are all we need. Speak. May your name be glorified. May I remain humble in the process. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. But even before we read, Jesus Christ, you look into his background, the genealogy in Matthew. What you see there is not a pretty background. No. In his background, there are signs and pictures of prostitution, adultery, incest, humanizing, idol worship, all from his background. He's Jesus. We are in a good place together. If your history, your family history is not pretty, you are in a good place. I don't come from a very pretty background as well. 
Know that nothing I can talk about to say, oh, I know even anybody on my father's side. Zero. Nothing. So I stand here, I have a mother's side, uncles, aunties. That side is zero. Nothing. And I look at that family, that's my mother's side. Is everything pretty over there? No. Divorce, divorce, remarriage, divorce, separation, divorce, divorce. It's not pretty. So I am not in any better place than you are. And I'm sure if you dig into your own family, you would have stories to tell of not pretty sights, nothing pretty there to be, you know, really joyful about. So we can identify with Abraham being an idol worshiper and God choosing him and walking with him. Let's read our text. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75-year-old man, 75 years of idol worship. God chooses him, says, move from your country, your family, your home, your relatives to a place I will show you. I used to think when I read that text without looking at the map that, oh, where, would he, where does he, you know, start from? Did he just start wandering around? But looking at the map, it clearly shows that there is a route he can follow to start to, to, to begin to go. He was called from air of the Chaldees in the yellow, you know, um, colored place. And God said, move. To the land I will show you. So he starts to go, starts to go, starts to go. And when he reaches the place God has destined for him, God said, this is the place. And the thing I want us to, to get from this is God speaks every time to us through his word. All he expects us to do is to obey. And when you obey, further directions, further clarifications will come. If Abraham had remained where he was when God spoke to him, he would not realize any land to inherit. He would not realize any of the blessings that God had offered him. There was a condition. Go. I will bless you. I will make you great. Let's Continue to read the, the text from verses 5 to 7 of chapter 12. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Mori. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Something significant. He arrives at the land, the location, and God says, I will give you this land. I will give you this land and I will give it to your offspring. God introduces another blessing. When the first instruction to you, you have not followed it, don't expect anything else to come. 
You want to make sense of God's direction for your life? The very basic one he tells you, just follow it. It doesn't matter your station in life. Okay, I'm contemplating marriage. What does that look like? I'm looking for a job. What does that look like? I am sick. What does that look like? Each of these, we can get direction from God's word. But if you choose to say, oh, this is what I like, and so this is what I will do, and you set out on your own path to do what you will do, and then encounter a problem, then you start crying out, God, where are you? God, where are you? Sometimes you may have to retrace your steps and go back and start afresh. It may not be easy. When I listen to the news, many are struggling, many are suffering, many are going through difficult moments. As I engage with young people, read what's going on in the world of young people, adults, and all that. It's, it's just challenging. But even in all of those challenging moments, our hope, our confidence, our direction is in God's word. When we neglect that and think we can gain some kind of knowledge from some place more reputable, Maybe our education, maybe technology, whatever that may be, we will fail. And that is what this message is all about. Is there anything God cannot do? For Abraham, at 75, old as he was, idol worship, he had to completely be transformed. Leave that entire culture. Leave that entire way of worship. Complete. And start afresh. Are you ready to start afresh? Are you ready to start afresh from where you are in life? If the path on which you are on is the wrong path. Are you ready to start afresh? Abraham agreed after 70 years to start afresh. And say, yes, I'm ready to go. It takes a heart of humility to say, I want to start afresh. So, back to our text, he hears this, he moves. Now, the promises are, I'll bless you, I'll bless all those who bless you. I'll give you the land, I'll give it to your offspring. And mind you, Abraham knows he has no children. He knows his wife is barren. If he does not know, after how many years of marriage, he would know by that time. Sarah knows. I can't have children. So this God saying, we are going to have children, how is that going to work? I, I'm sure they were thinking about it. But probably they believed that, yes, that may work. Let's see how all that goes. They stay there not long after there is a famine. There is hunger. They are in the promised land and there is hunger there. So even when you are doing the right thing, serving God and all of that, there could be challenges within the confines of God's will for your life. Following God does not protects you from suffering. Why? Jesus himself had to suffer for our sake. And he says, the world hated him, the world will hate you. And so, challenges and difficulties will come your way. But I am with you even to the end of the world. He promises that to us. He promised that to Abraham. And so Abraham believed that. And so when hunger came, well, what do I do? Now there is farming, we need food. So he chooses 
to travel to Egypt. We can look at the map. Why that made sense? From where they were, they were now in Canaan, in the red portion. So Egypt is just the brown portion. So if there is hunger in the promised land, I'd rather go to the, promise, the, the, the um, place we hear there is food. Just before they go, instead of depending on God, they make their own arrangements. You know, you are my wife, you are pretty. Probably those Egyptians may be interested in you. When we get there, say, you are my sister, so that I will be safe. They make that arrangement, they go there, and indeed, the Pharaoh was interested. Took Sarah to the palace, but God intervened. And out of that, God blessed Abraham so much that he came out of Egypt when he went there as a hungry man with his hungry family. He came out a rich man. Genesis chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, and I read. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abraham. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, camels. Even when we make mistakes and turn on the wrong path, God can redirect and make good his promises for us. Abraham chose to lie to protect himself. God knew his wife was in danger, protected Abraham, and out of that, blessings. And again, when blessings come, challenges accompany blessings. And we will see that. Sometimes you think, oh, the more I become prosperous in what I do, the better life will be and the less troubles I will have. I, I, I think you may be thinking wrongly. Because once Abraham had all these blessings in his life, they returned and came back to Canaan. Now, Lot also had acquired some cattle and they didn't have enough grass land to feed their animals. So, out of that, Abraham said, Lot, make your choice. And then whatever is left, I'll take. Lot looks for the greener place, nice place you can take care of your animals, chooses that, and leaves. There God appears to Abraham and says, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. Wherever your eyes can see, those are the lands I will give to you. We who are God's children are called to trust in him. Even in our difficult moments, we can rely on him because he is a faithful God. Up to this point, still no children. More property. The blessings have started. The physical blessings, the animals, riches have started. 75 years old. Time goes by. Year one, no child. Year two, no child. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm sure Abraham is asking, this promise God made, when is that coming to pass? I'm sure Sarah will be also asking, I don't think this is real, maybe. They are contemplating. In chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, there is this interaction between Abraham and God. And we will see how Abraham is thinking, how he is processing, and how he is trying to make sense of all the promises God had given him. 
And I'll read. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, Oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Still doubtful. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. Number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. The man has not got one child. Now he's counting stars. And he's being told, you will have children more than these stars you are counting. If you can count them, that's just how many children you're going to have. Well, it is God speaking. Maybe let me believe it. So this is his reaction. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. So there are these times in our life where we will feel so close to God and we will be pursuing what he's saying, pursuing his promises. And there will be times when there will be doubts. There will be doubts as to, is this real? Will this happen as has been promised? That's exactly what was happening to Abraham. We go to verse 7. And he said to him, God speaking, I am the Lord who brought you out from heir of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Abraham again. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Still, doubts. The man known as the one who has faith in the Bible was doubtful at some points in his life. So when you feel doubtful about some situations in your life, it is okay. But you shouldn't stay doubtful all the time. You should get direction from God's word to realign to his purposes, to realign to his plan for your life. Because if you would depend on your understanding, your circumstance, your experiences, your background, you will say to yourself, what I read in the Bible is not real. I can't identify with that. But if that becomes your core, even when you shift like a pendulum one side, you will be able to swing to the other end and come back to your core. That's what happened to Abraham. And like I mentioned earlier on, when you get blessed, within the blessing comes challenges. Remember, when he was in Egypt, he had donkeys, he had camels, he had oxen, he had sheep, all that. And he had made servants. Man servants. Ten years goes by, and Sarah says, You know what? We've been waiting. It's now ten years. If God can do something, I'm sure He would have done it. You know what? Let's pick one of these um, maid servants we have to, you know, help you have a child so that that child can be our child. At that moment, Abraham could not exercise his faith. What kind of girl do you think Hagar 
to us to have been the chosen one by Sarah. Arrogant, rude, disrespectful, lazy. I don't think so. She must have been the humble, hardworking, you know, submissive. So she was the chosen one. Okay? They went to do what they do, and a child is born. People can change. People and circumstances. No, circumstances can make people change. That's what I wanted to say. Circumstances can make people change. And so now her status has been elevated from a maid to a wife or a concubine, whatever that term may be. She now becomes disrespectful. She now becomes arrogant. And it becomes challenging for Sarah. In the blessing that God had provided for Abraham came the trap, the challenge, which he could not overcome. He tried, he and Sarah tried to fix the problem themselves. Are you trying to fix the problem yourself? I have tried to fix some of my problems myself, and it was catastrophic. I'll share some of that with you. I remember when I left Ghana and came to Canada, I knew that God had called me for a purpose to come and study and prepare for full-time ministry. I had just enough money to do my first year school and just a little to get by. COVID came 2020. I was here. January, February, March, and I was thinking to myself, okay, the money I have for school and living expenses is lying idle, COVID, no business, nothing is working, no employment, nothing. What do I do? But maybe let me invest some of this money. Let me look at the trading and see where I can, you know, invest and make some money on it so that I can continue to have a life. Even though I knew when I left home, I was depending on God. Only. Not on coming to trade, not on coming to do business. None of that. But you know what? I was looking at the trading in the market and I saw oil prices going down. Going down. I said, wow. And I look at the trend for the past years. What? Oil used to sell at 100, 150, 120, and now it's dropping 30, 20, 25, 20, then goes up, comes down, goes up. Did the analysis. I said, no, I think this is the time to enter. And then when the COVID and whatever things, you know, change, turn around, then I would be able to make some money to take care of me. You would not believe it. I called my friend back home in Ghana. Say, hey, there's opportunity for us to invest here. Send some money. We will inv- I would invest, and I showed him all the trends, everything. He said, I think it makes sense. He pulled money from his account in Ghana. I pulled some money I had in Ghana, brought here, the money I had in school, put it all together, and entered the market. I entered the market April 20th, 2020. Oil became negative $37. All the money. Whoosh. Then I sat in my room in the school <laughs> dorm held my head and said, what is this that I have done to myself? Now I have even worsened my situation. Before I left Ghana to Canada, I had clear indication what God had directed me to do. Why did I come and get involved in this? How do I even explain to my friend all the money is lost? Of course, he was also on the, on the market seeing what happened, but how do, I, how, how do I make him first understand too and either refund the money, whatever that would be? I was worried. I was very worried. Prayed about it. Next morning, called him, told him, hey, buddy, we lost. He asked, by how much? I said, zero. You lost everything. Showed him the screenshots 
of the tree. I couldn't believe it. All he said was, it's just one of those things. And this is not a rich person. This is someone back home struggling to make a living. I felt guilty. I felt bad. 2020 April, we, I talked to him regularly. We have not talked about this ever since. He's never brought it up. I've never brought it up. And when I think about it, how someone can just forgive you for a loss like that, it's only God that can bring peace. So, again, when we try to solve our own problems, we try to turn around and find ways we create problems for ourselves. Like Abraham, for the moment, it seemed it was okay. They've got a child. They are happy. Maybe this is what God planned and God didn't even tell us we could have, you know, used this uh, um, Egyptian, you know, Oh, now we found a solution. We got an answer. God comes back and has an interaction with them and says, that is not the child I am talking about. That's not it. You missed the boat. Some of us have equally missed the boat in our lives. Be it our marriages. We've married the wrong people. We knew before we married them. Some we are even not married. We are not married. But we are having relations which are creating problems. Some, the kind of jobs. Some, so even young people today, this is for you. This is your time to be in school. This is your time to study. This is your time to do what you have to do to obey your parents. That's what God's word says. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee. This is the time to obey. So, oh, I have rights. You can't tell me what to do. Okay? You do your own thing, consequences will come. God's word is as true as we read it. What are you struggling with? Is it a job? Dissatisfied job? You've been laid off? Ailment? Depressed? Anxiety? Or your children have become prodigals? Prodigal sons? Prodigal daughters? Whatever you are going through, we have a living God who is alive and faithful to his word. If only we will come and attend to his word. When we try to fix our own problems, it comes with more problems. Like Abraham, he had his child, but fast forward, he had to send that child away. Can you imagine sending your child away? A child that has grown up in your home. 13 years, now they have their own child. And the arrogance is still on probably. And Ishmael is now making fun of the newborn baby. Oh, old, old people's baby whatever he may have said. They threw him out. When we make some decisions, it will come, bad decisions, which are contrary to God's word, it will come back to haunt us. It will come back to haunt us. And we can't blame God for it. Even when we are doing what is right, things can become turbulent. Like Abraham, he was doing some Things right. He was in the promised land and hunger came. Farming came. He had to leave. As we go on, let's read Genesis chapter 17, verse 17. We have two verses there. 
God comes back through an angel to talk to this Abraham and Sarah. After 25 years of the promise, all right? So God appeared to, to them now at age 99. 99. Now the angel comes and tells Abraham, you are going to have a child. Can you imagine? Oh. <laughs> what? After we have money to get one child, you are telling me we will have another child. He said, no, you will have another child through Sarah, the one, your wife. And they laugh. They say, God, now you are on the joking route. You are joking. This is a joke. Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed. Are you laughing at God in your life right now? And making fun and saying, people may be telling you, you know, this is the way to go. God's word says it's forget. It doesn't work. I've done that all the time. It doesn't work. Ah, you are still talking Bible stuff, Sunday school stuff. Forget about that. It doesn't work. We are in the modern era. Do you necessarily have to abstain from fornication before you marry? No. You have to make sure you know who you are marrying and check things out. Okay. You get the consequences of what actions you take. When the unplanned child comes and you become frustrated with that unplanned child or the wife or the girl leaves you or the man says, I, I wasn't prepared for this. I thought we were just playing around a little bit. Why did you allow yourself to get pregnant? No, no, I don't want children. I'm gone. And you have a child. Because what God's word say, you say, no, it doesn't work that way. I must try. I must figure things out for myself. Why do I need a believer as, as a partner? No, I don't need a believer. I need someone who likes me and I like. Okay? We make decisions away from God's word, it will come back to hunt us. So, at this point, Abraham fell on his face and laughed at what God had promised. Sarah did the same. But does that deter God from doing what he had promised to do? No. Even if you laugh at God, his promises are sure and they will come to pass. It is up to each and every one of us to search our hearts, including myself, as I speak today on this topic, I am also wrestling with things in my own life. Trusting God to do it for me. And there are days I have doubts. And I have to go back to his word and assure myself that he is faithful. You may also go through that. Job went through that. Everybody goes through the ups and downs. But you don't remain down. You go down, you come up through his word, not through science, not through whatever the world is saying. Come back to life through his word. So our forefather, Abraham and Sarah laughed, but God fulfilled his promise. That was when God asked, the, the angel asked, is there anything too hard for God to do? When they laughed, that's when he asked them, is there anything too difficult for God to do? And that's the question to all of us. Is there anything too difficult for God to do? And my answer, no, it's nothing. It's nothing. My own life's experiences have taught me there is nothing too difficult. I remember when I was called to come and candidate for the role in this church. I got the message, scheduled the dates, and then the very day I had planned that we would travel, I said, okay, let me go check out the vehicle before we can travel. Took the vehicle in. So no, you, you have a problem with your brakes. So okay, yeah, maybe brakes, uh, nothing much. Give us an invoice. 1,500. What? 
said, no, this is not real. I'll call another, another um, mechanic shop. I called 1,850. I said, ah, it's getting worse. I said, okay, you know what? I- I'm going to drive from where we were four hours away to go and fix it. My wife said, you are going nowhere. The, 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 the brakes are not good. How do you drive four hours away? No, you stay here. I said, okay. That was when I just said to myself, you know what? God, it's in your hands. You know everything. So I come back home, and I'm seated. I get back from the mechanic's shop with my 1,500 bill. Come and I'm seated. It wasn't even 20 minutes. I hear a knock on my door. That's strange. (laughs) We typically don't have visitors. I go to the door, and this is a colleague from work. He comes. He says, oh, I just brought this to you. I I heard um, you are planning, you know, to leave the town because I had resigned from the job as I was preparing for this role and candidating. And so I brought you, he brought me a check worth 500 dollars. This is not my friend. I'll be honest with you. He's not my friend. Not been to his house before. He has not been to my house before. All we do at work is I see him in his office. Hey, hi, how are things going? And we will laugh, chat, and I'll go away. He came to my house, gave me that money. I said, okay, this is 500. I go to the place and deposit that. I'm waiting. Two days time, he said, oh, your car will be ready. And I'm thinking, how will I finance the rest of the bill. I get back to the the shop. I have paid 500 already. I had 500 of my own money I was going to use. I get there. They print the new bill. The bill is 1,000. I said, there may be something wrong. Check the bill again. They said, oh, no, no, it is. It's it's 1,000. I said, how come? Oh, we sourced the part from a different company and it was less by $500. I said, which business person does that? They quote you a high price. They get a cheaper deal somewhere. Will they pass it on to the customer? I don't know many businesses that would do that. They pass it on to me. Thank you. So my $500, I end up using it to pay. I go back home within a few days and I get... A check from CRA, some re- returns. I said, yeah, everything covered. And I sit back and say, God can do things that we worry about and stress ourselves about. And I've seen him do things like this over and over and over again in my life. And so when, when the difficult moments come, sometimes I tend to want to go the other way and feel like it is I I can figure it out myself but I'm prompted when I remember the things of the past he has done in my life to stay connected and the lessons I would want to pick from this is I want to share with you is Whatever your background, your circumstance, your experience, your disappointments, your pain, your frustrations, and the delay, nothing is too hard for God. The first lesson for us is God is faithful even when things do not make sense to us. God is still faithful. Two, God's timing is not based on our desires. God's timing for what he's doing in your life is not based on what you desire. He works in his own time. Abraham felt, no, by this time this should have happened. And so he went and recreated his situation. But God, at the appointed time, gave the promise. Three, age cannot prevent God's plan from coming to pass. Sarah said, can I have pleasure at this time and have a child? That was natural, everyday thinking. But God can turn things around. Your age does not matter. Your circumstance does not matter. Your background does not matter. When God is moving, he moves through all those hindrances 
that you may be contemplating. The next one, our family background does not stop us from God's plan for our life. Idol worshiper, idol worshiper. Wherever you are coming from, whatever your hindrance, from where you are coming from, God can take it, clean you up, change you, and send you to where you ought to be. This is an open door for each of us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, this is an opportunity. There's no hindrance. The next thing is, even if you try to self-sabotage, you cannot prevent God's plan from materializing in your life. As in, take things into your own hands and try to make things work for you. God can still redirect things or go and tell lies. God can still redirect things and put things back on course. The next is, God unveils his plan as we obey and step out in faith. When you choose not to obey, the plan stays put. You obey, you unveil the next level. You obey, you unveil the next level. The next one is, final one, doubts are a normal part of the faith journey, but we must overcome it by depending on God's word. Where are you in this life? What could you be dealing with? Trauma, grief, rejection, abandonment, medical problems, depression, feeling stuck, anxiety, dissatisfaction with your job, financial crisis, sense of hopelessness, family problems, whatever. Name it. All is not beyond the God we serve. He is mighty, all-powerful, all-knowing. He does what he wills. And I invite you to come into that place where you have complete trust in him. If you don't know him, this is your opportunity to come to the Savior and rest at his feet so he can direct and navigate your life for you. Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we bow before you, recognizing our weakness and our failures and our struggles, the pain, the hurt, the disappointments, looking at Abraham, where you took him from and who he became, may that inspire us that you can do anything and everything. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each of us here who has a pressing need of some sort that troubles them at night that they will lay it at your feet. They will trust in you. And Lord, may you show them your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.